Welcome everyone to our second symposia for the semester at the Graduate Center. These are sponsored by the CPBF at Princeton and CUNY and the Initiative for Theoretical Sciences at CUNY. Um, and when they used to happen in person, they were highly interactive. Um, and given the constraints, we are trying to um, emulate that. And one nice thing is a lot of people from different parts can participate. So the number of participants um, is significantly higher. And today's symposium is gonna be about uh, neural dynamics across scale. Um, and so neural activity and the computations driven by it exhibit uh, rich dynamics at several scales, going from the level of a single neuron to networks all the way to driving behavior. Um, and so today we are really excited to have uh, eminent researchers to theorists and an experimentalist uh, who have worked on uh, a variety of questions spanning this entire range. Um, and so we are excited to hear from them. And just to point about the logistics, uh, the talks are going to be 90 minutes long, so there's ample time for discussion. Um, and the plan is the speakers will have um, pauses roughly interspersed throughout the talk um, where questions are entertained. Um, but if you have a pressing question, you can unmute and ask. Um, otherwise, we encourage you to use the chat to post questions, and we'll be moderating that. Um, and um, if the speakers are able to do that, we encourage them to do that as well. Um, and so with that, um, as our first speaker, we are very happy to have Surgeon Ostwich, uh, who's from uh, who's with the ENS Paris. And uh, Surgeon has worked a lot on um, understanding the dynamics of RNNs and connecting them to computation and function. Um, and this is a line of work I find quite exciting. So this should, I, I'm sure we are in for a very exciting talk. So Surgeon, please, whenever um, you're ready. Hi, everyone. Let me just share my screen. Thanks a lot for, for inviting me to, to this symposium. It's a, it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be part of it. And uh, thanks for, to everybody for, 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 for showing up uh, today. So I was, I was originally asked to target a, a broad physics biophysics audience. So um, in this talk, I will present a theoretical framework that is motivated by neuroscience, but it's in fact more general. So today I will I'll focus more on the theoretical parts. And so before I start, I just want to acknowledge the people uh, behind this work. So this whole line of work started with uh, Francesca Master Giuseppe, who is now at, at Gatsby. And today I will be um, talking about uh, recent developments that were led by uh, Alexis Dubreuil, uh, Adrian Valente, and Man Manuel Beran. We also have um, a, a very exciting collaboration with uh, Friedrich Schussler and Omri Barak at, at, at all right, so uh, relating structure and, and function uh, is, is, of course, a central question to, to all of biology. And so within neuroscience, function is, is behavior, um, how an animal transforms stimuli into, into motor actions, while structure is the structure of the brain, and in, in particular, how neurons are connected to each other. And over the last decade, uh, well, there has been spectacular progress, both on quantifying describing behavior and on uh, measuring connectivity. So we're now approaching the stage where we can get single cell connectivity uh, for, 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 for the cortex. Uh, but yeah, the obvious question is, what are we going to do with this data? How are we going to relate structure and function? So what, what is clear is that uh, we need to intermediate levels of description that lie between connectivity and behavior. And so one such level is of course, neural activity. So, uh, Experimentalists routinely record neural activity during behavior. And here, this is an example from, from a from seminal paper by uh, Valerio Monte and David Susillo, in which uh, they trained a monkey to, uh, well, to, to, to look at a visual stimulus consisting of moving dots, and then to report whether the dots are moving mostly to the left or to the right. And so they recorded the activity in the prefrontal cortex during this task. And what they found is that, well, many neurons um, well, have an activity that is directly related to the task. However, every neuron does something different. So it's very hard to interpret neurons uh, one by one on an individual basis. So instead of looking at, at individual neurons, the, the approach that has emerged is to look at the population as a whole. And uh, so to represent activity in terms of trajectories in what is called the neural state space. And so this is the space where every axis corresponds to the activity of one neuron. 
So in general, this is a very high dimensional uh, space, uh, but um, in many cases, it, well, researchers, researchers have found that the activity is constrained to a low dimensional part of the space. So that usually the next step is to look for a nice low dimensional projection that captures what, uh, what the activity is doing. And so in, in, this, in this paper, they found well, very nice projections. So for example, this one, in which one axis quantifies the motion of the dots, so the direction of the motion uh, in the stimulus, while the other axis uh, represents the choice. And so, so activity on different trials corresponds to trajectories in this plane. And so these trajectories basically show how uh, information about the stimulus is transformed into a choice. So this is a very compelling description in which uh, well, we see how neural activity basically implements the computation. And so this is an example of what has become a broader conceptual framework for um, understanding how computations emerge from collective dynamics. So this framework uh, has been called computations through dynamics. And it basically posits that uh, neural dynamics in the sp state space should be uh, thought of as a low dimensional dynamical system that can be described by a, a small number of collective variables, uh, which are usually called latent variables. And I'm, in this talk, I'm gonna to refer to these latent variables as, as kappas, while, while u's correspond to external inputs. Okay, so this picture in terms of latent dynamics uh, gives us a nice intermediate level of description between structure and function. And so then the original question uh, becomes two different questions. So one is how structure determines this latent uh, low dimensional dynamics. And then the second question is how function determines what type of latent dynamics are needed to, uh, to, to, to perform a, a given computation. And so these questions are of course still very difficult to answer for, for a real biological system. Uh, well, because the data are complex and, and incomplete, uh, so the approach that has emerged is, well, to, to focus on, a, on, a, on computational models and try to, to, and try to understand this relationship in, in, in computational models, and in particular in recurrent neural networks, which can be trained um, to perform, uh, well, the same tasks as, as animals using, for example, back, back propagation. So, uh, yeah, so recurrent neural networks are, are a very rich system. They can in, pl in principle implement any task and then we have directly access to the full structure, the full connectivity. We can also extract latent dynamics and we know what the function is, but it's still very hard to relate these different levels. And um, so there, there are basically two, two difficulties. So, so the first question is how does the structure determine this latent dynamics? And this is a question where we could use tools from statistical physics in, in particular except that uh, statistical physics typically deals with fully random matrices. So understanding how non-random structure uh, in, in an arbitrary matrix uh, determines the dynamics is, is, is pretty much an open question. For an arbitrary matrix, we, we don't really know what is the relevant structure. And so today I'm, I'm going to introduce a class of simplified models in which uh, we can directly understand what the relevant structure is and how the structure determines uh, the dynamics. Then in the second step, I will address the second question, which is, uh, well, basically what kind of latent dynamics we need to, to, to implement uh, uh, the, the different, different computations. Uh, all right, so this is the outline for the talk today. So I will start by presenting this theoretical framework uh, uh, based on a class of networks that we call uh, low rank uh, recurrent uh, networks. Uh, so I'll spend most of my time uh, on this today. And so uh, I really hope this, this will be interactive. And so please, please do ask questions and I will try to stop regularly to, to take the questions. Um, and then, so depending on, on, on the time that's left. So um, I, I'll show you how we use this framework to reverse engineer networks trained on neuroscience tasks. And in particular, how we use this to, uh, to extract mechanisms uh, in terms of latent variables. And so, so what we find is that the two concepts that are really important, which are latent variables and, and, and cell classes. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to start with the theoretical framework. And let me just real quickly introduce the general class of models. So recurrent neural networks, uh, or also known as vanilla RNNs. And so every neuron is characterized by a variable Xi, which represents the total input that it gets. And this total input is a sum of an external input, 
which in the simplest case is a scalar multiplied by feed forward weights. Uh, and, and then this is, this is the sum of external inputs and recurrent inputs, which are basically specified by the connectivity matrix, uh, which multiplies, uh, well, a nonlinear function applied on the activity of presynaptic nerves. Uh, for concreteness, I'll be using hyperbolic tangent, but uh, we, yeah, we can, we can use any nonlinear function uh, here. Okay, so this is a very broad class of models. And for an arbitrary connectivity matrix, uh, it's, it's actually quite difficult to analyze um, the, the dynamics. So um, our approach has been to, uh, to focus on a subclass of models uh, that correspond to a simplified uh, limited class of connectivity matrices. And yeah, so, so really the central starting point is, is the simple observation that any matrix can be decomposed, um, can be expanded in the sum of other products between row and column vectors. So for example, we can use a single value decomposition to, for, for, to get such an expansion. And then the idea is that, uh, well, a small number of those terms will play the role of a structure to determine the, the, the dynamics, uh, while the remainder of the terms can be considered uh, random. So, so the structure that we will be looking at so the, of the connectivity is, is, well, our matrices in which we have a lower rank structure. So where each of these terms is a rank one matrix. And so the sum is rank R. Um, and then in general, we can also have a random, a random term here. And the key point is that each of these terms is specified by two vectors. So a uh, column vector, which so I'm going to call these color vectors with the letter M and row vectors, which I'm, uh, which, which I'm gonna call n. And uh, so, yeah, so these vectors, so we can also call, call them patterns. So I'm also going to refer to them as connectivity patterns. Um, yeah, perhaps maybe this is a good, a good, a good time for a first break. So just to make sure whether this is, is, everything is clear so far about the model class. Any questions? No. So, uh, what do the superscripts mean? I think I missed that. Uh, oh, superscript. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the superscripts are is, so. so it's, this is an expansion. So, for an n by n matrix, an n by n matrix can be expanded uh, in in n terms, and so the superscript is the order of of each term in the in the expansion. Okay. Thanks. Um, all right, so, so why, why consider this class of models? So why, why is this the relevant type of structure? Uh, well, when we started this work, uh, well, we looking at the literature, we realized that actually many specific models in the neuroscience literature uh, actually belong to, to, to this class. And yeah, the most, uh, the most famous of course is the, the, the Hopfield model in which, uh, well, well, in which memories are implemented through, uh, well, outer products of, 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 of patterns with, with themselves. But, uh, well, there are many other models that, that have the same structures, so the ring model, echo state force, uh, neural engineering. So I'm, I'm not going to go through, through the details of these models, but this is, uh, this is probably not a complete list. list. Uh, moreover, so those kind of models turn out to be directly related to models used in the statistic community for dimensionality reduction and for describing data, uh, in particular models such as uh, what's called latent dynamical systems. Uh, more recently, so we realized that when training arbitrary networks to perform simple tasks, we, we also realized that this training in fact introduces precisely this type of structure. So, 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 so a, lower, a lower rank structure and by training uh, here, I mean really uh, just uh, straight uh, back propagation, so gradient descent. Uh, but most importantly, uh, the reason for us to, to look at these models is that they're mathematically tractable and, and can be used to extract interpretable, interpretable mechanisms. And so this is what I'm going to, to try to show you in the, in the, in, in the next uh, slides. Um, yeah, and today, so I will focus on the case where there's no random, uh, random term. Uh, well, interesting phenomena can happen if you have a random term, and those are covered in, in these papers, but I will not have the time to, to talk much about this uh, today. 
So, all right, so let me let me summarize again the, the low-rank framework. So, so we started with a general RNN, which has inputs, a connectivity matrix, and then the readout. And now we're replacing this connectivity matrix by a low-rank matrix, which is which can be described in, in terms of this outer product of patterns, so that what we get is a system. Uh, well, described by a set of vector of, of patterns. So one, one vector for the input weights, then pairs of vectors for the connectivity, and then uh, a vector for, 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 for the readout. And, and it turns out that so in such a system, the, the, the dynamics are basically determined by the relationships between these vectors. And, and this dynamics, uh, well, uh, are in fact low dimensional with the dimensionality being determined by the, by the rank of the connectivity matrix. Uh, yeah, so, so let me say this again. So what we can show in, in, in this class of models is that the activity lies in a, in a subspace that is uh, spanned by two sets of vectors. So uh, one part of the subspace is, 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 is input driven. So it's, 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 uh, well, it's mapped by, by these input weights. And then the second part of the subspace is determined by the recurring connectivity, and it's mapped by this M vectors, so the, the column vectors that, that, they that they introduced a couple of slides back. And so the activity, so the low dimensional activity can be de described in terms of, a, uh, of latent variables, so collective variables, so, so the inputs, and then what I call collective latent variables, which are collective variables generated by recurrent activity, and is one of these for each of the uh, rank one terms. Okay, so these kappas, so these are the latent variables generated by recurrent connectivity, and these are the, the main uh, quantities uh, we are interested in. And basically using an approach um, inspired by mean field theory, uh, what we can show is that we can describe the dynamics in terms of this latent variables. And we can show that the dynamics of the latent variables basically um, form a dynamical system, which we can fully describe. And now very remarkably, so in general, well, uh, under some assumptions, and I'm, I'll come to the, them in the next slides, so these dynamical systems of latent variables can be equivalently described by effective circuits in which latent variables interact with each other and with the inputs through uh, effective coupling terms. Okay, so this is this is kind of a uh, yeah very compact summary of a, of so very very abstract uh, summary of the whole framework, and I'm going to, to to take you a little bit through the details uh, to try to give you some intuition of how this comes about and how this works. Okay, so I'm going to focus on the on the simplest possible example, uh, which is a rank one network. Uh, which is linear, so the transfer function will be, will be linear, and we take just a, 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 a single input. And so, so this is how this network looks like. So there's a the vector of weights and for the input. Uh, was there a question? Okay, I, I'll just carry on. Uh, uh, so uh, very quick. So you assume those m vectors, the the principal the principal directions are um, time independent. Oh yes, so so everything is constant here. So so all these parameters are constant. Thank you. Uh, so what the time dependence comes in through the inputs basically. So so this so, so there's a scalar which is time dependent and it multiplies this input weights. Uh, so, so so that's that's the, that's the input here, and then the connectivity here is is rank one meaning that it can be written so as an outer product of M, I, and J. And here, well, I just in include the normalization for, for scaling reasons. Okay, so this is basically the recurrent connectivity matrix. You know, what you can directly see from here is that, well, there are basically two terms here. So there's one along this vector I, and then if you look at this term here, so M, I, so it's independent of J, so we can take it out of the sum. So we have here another term that's along a vector M. So in general, the activity is going to be two-dimensional and it will have two components. So one along the vector i and another component along the vector m. And so this component along the vector m, I'm going to call it kappa one. So that's our first uh, latent variable. 
Okay, so now <clears throat> the next step is to, well, get the dynamics of, of, this, of this latent variables. And to do this, well, we'll basically project this equation onto the vectors i and m. So let's first project on, on, on i. And for simplicity, so now I'm assuming that i and m are orthogonal, otherwise we would have to orthogonalize them, which can be done. So projecting on, on i, so this term here, so this term is along m, so it's orthogonal to i. So, so what is left is projection of x on i is v, and, and here u, so, so, so this, this v here is basically just an integral of the input. So v is just a, a low pass filter input. Okay, so that, this is pretty straightforward. Now the next step is to project onto M to get the dynamics for kappa. So projecting X on M so we get kappas. This term here is orthogonal to M. And so what we are left here is, is the sum here of MJ, XJ. Uh, all right, now the next step is to, so we have this XJs here. So we're going to take the expression for X and put it inside this term here. And so then we have, two terms, and what happens is that, so we have one term multiplying kappa one, another term multiplying V. Now, if you look at those terms, so they have a very simple expression. So, so, so those terms are the scalar product. So this is the scalar product between N and M, and this term here is the scalar product between N and I. And if we take N very large, so, so the scalar products are basically going to become correlations between N and M and N and, and I, and I'm going to call them sigma N and M and sigma N and, and I. All right, and so this is our key equation. So this is the, the equation for, 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 for the, the latent variable kappa one. And yeah, it's a very simple equation. So it's a leak integration of the input V uh, through an effective coupling, which is this overlap between N and I. And then there's a feedback term here, which is just the overlap between N and M. So we can represent this as an effective circuit to where kappa, so integrates V through this effective coupling and then there's this, this, this self-feedback. Self okay, so I'm going to, to take questions at, the, at this point. So I think it's important to, to make sure everybody's on the same page here. So there is, uh, there's a question in the chat. It's quite many... primitive actually. Uh, uh, can I ask, I am, it might be um, quite a primitive question. Is there any intuition? Actually, you are using a, a basis, I guess, of vectors to understand the low ranked part. Is there an intuition for that? So, so, so for which part exactly? So, so here, I'm just taking the very beginning term. The very beginning. The, so, 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 when so you, this part here? decompose to some random part and some non-random part, mm -hmm. that non-random part yeah. represent what? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 that's, so the intuition here is basically, so it's a little indirect. The intuition is if you look at many models in the literature, you find out that this, that what plays the key computational role is are actually structures of, of this term. So, so, so from the literature, we kind of, decided to look at this model class. So, 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 so at this point, I'm just sort of taking this as a starting point. I'm just saying, okay, let's just look at rank one term and let's try to understand what it does. And then we'll come back to, the, so once we understand what it does, well, we'll it's gonna clarify why, why this is important for, for computations. Uh, thank you, but uh, if you allow me, is it possible to actually measure these vectors, these eigen, am I supposed to call them eigenvectors for your low ranked space? Um, no, so I think it's better to call them single vectors, but, but it's, not, it's not a unique, uh, so, 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 so for, for rank one, so, 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 so basically, so what you can do is, so if you take a matrix, you can do a single value decomposition, and the single value decomposition gives you a sum of terms ranked by their singular value. And so the first the dominant singular mode uh, is going to be in, uh, well, you're going to have a left and right singular vectors. And, the, and, and, so, and so you can think of this rank one term as, 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 as the first singular mode. Okay, thank you. Are there any uh, 
questions uh, about the dynamics and about the derivation. It, there, there's a question from Bill, um, and he's asking if I project equation one with n instead of m, is everything consistent? It looks like the equation closes around n times x. Yeah, exactly. So, 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 so in a sense, uh, well, you have to project it to, on m because this equation, so you see that there's no activity generated along n. The activity is generated along m. So m and n are not uh, are not uh, are not symmetric. So m really sort of goes out, and and then you, so n always sums with with, with the with the x. Okay. Um, so there's a so, so, so sense you, we have to project with an m. Okay. All right, so, so I'm going to carry on. So I wanted to, well, to show you more, concrete, more con concretely what this means. So let's look at, at a given network. So we can just generate i, n, and m, for example, randomly. And we can so to look at a case where i, n, and m are three orthogonal vectors. Uh, OK, so, so what that means is, so the connectivity here in the network is non-zero. So there's a non-zero recurrent connectivity. There's a non-zero feedforward connectivity. But at the level of the effective circuit, well, there's no effective connectivity at all because the, the scalar product is zero. And so now if you run such a network, so we give it the step of input u, well, the different neurons uh, respond. And every, every neuron responds differently. But what the theory predicts is that this response here is, is basically one dimensional uh, along the vector i. So basically the network just reproduces inputs. And if we plot the dynamics in, in into this space, so, 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 so well, we, we just see that the dynamics are one dimensional. Okay, and this is consistent with the fact that, well, all the effective couplings are, are zero. Uh, now, Slightly more interesting. So now, if we can change n in such a way that n overlaps with with the inputs, uh, and now, well, okay, so we still have a heterogeneous response, but now what we expect is a two-dimensional response because now this effective coupling uh, is non-zero, set so that this input now actually excites this mode n, and so it it, it generates a non-zero kappa, and so that the dynamics are in fact uh, two dimension. Um, and, and so, yeah, and so, so there's a fundamental uh, intuition to get here, which is that this, the role of the, so, so, so the vectors M and N have different roles. So M is, so activity, recurrent activity is generated along M, but to generate this activity along M, uh, well, the inputs need to have a non-zero projection on, on the, n vector. So this n vector is an input selection vector. So it selects which inputs lead to recurrent, non-trivial recurrent uh, dynamics. Surgeon, there's a clarification question in the chat about this equation one, the population activity, sorry, the population activity equation. And is it um, for the steady state? Sorry, the next slide actually. Um, yeah. This one here? Yeah. Uh, no, so, so so in general, no. So so, if, so for this type of network, so this will be an exact equation. So with kappa and, and varying in time. So it's not a steady state. Sorry, can I elaborate on my question? Sure. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't understand this because um, you have this equation on the previous slide, which is the, the time derivative of X is equal to this thing on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. And and the population activity seems to you seem to get it by just setting the right hand side to zero. Is that right? Uh, no, no. So we get the population. Oh, oh so you mean Yeah. So, so... How do you get what is this X equals kappa M plus I? Uh huh. Yeah, so this is basically from? <laughs> so, 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 so this is this basically comes from observing that you have two terms here. So this term is along i, uh -huh. 
Uh -huh. so, 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 so to always lie along i, and this term here, so you can take m out, so we have a second term which is along m. Okay, and now I'm assuming that. Uh, okay, so, so there's a question of initial conditions. So you can treat initial conditions also as an input. B but, but but apart from this, uh, well, you're not going to get activity in any other dimension because there's nothing that generates activity in in in, in other dimensions. So this is a fully oh, closed. <clears throat> fully so closed so presumably case. so presumably v of t is some integral of u of t. Yes, yeah, so it's here. Sorry, I went fast over it. So, so v, v of t is just, yeah, exactly, an, an integral of u of t. Okay, okay. That's fine. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to jump back to, to this slide. Okay, so this is actually the, the, the end of this, this simple linear example. Uh, I mean, so this is linear dynamics, so you, you may think it's, it's, it's a little, little bit trivial. So the nice thing about this framework is that it generalizes very nicely to, um, to much more complicated cases. And so, uh, so the next case we can look at is, is now the, the nonlinear case. I'm going to put back the nonlinearity here and everything is going to be the same, but I'm just going to assume now a distribution, a given distribution for, for, for the values of these patterns. And I'm gonna assume that so the values for it, so every neuron has three values here, i, n, and m. And I'm going to assume that these three values are generated from a correlated Gaussian distribution, but that they're generated independently and identically for, for every neuron. Okay, and so the first step is that, uh, well, the activity is still 2D, so nothing changes because this M still, is, it still pops out here. So we still have these two terms here. But now with a little bit more work, so when we project on M, what we can show is that the dynamics for kappa, so the latent dynamics are, are in fact exactly the same as in the linear case, except that now this sigma here, uh, well, we've added tildes to, to the sigma. So, so what is the sigma till? It's the original sigma, so the overlap between vectors, multiplied by an average gain term. And so this is basically the, well, the average of the slope of the transfer function of, over the whole network. And okay, so, so this is very simple uh, uh, extension in a sense, but so remarkably, so this is exact. So this is, okay, so this was zero mean Gaussians, uh, but, but, but for zero mean Gaussians, this is exact. And, and so this looks like linear dynamics, but in fact, it's not linear because this gain here implicitly depends on kappa. So, so, so this, and this introduces a nonlinearity in those dynamics. And so this effective circuit remains the same, except that now we have this effective couplings which are scaled by, by the gain. So they actually depend on time now. And so this simple change so now introduces, uh, well, a bunch of nonlinear effects. So we can get gain modulation from this. So we, we can have an input that does not, that is not integrated, but that changes the gain uh, um, and modulates the effect of complex. And we can also have, uh, well, multi-stability. So this is multiple, multiple fixed points. Um, Okay, so uh, yeah, so maybe I, I should I should take questions here again before 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 moving on because this, 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 there's a lot going on here. So uh, I'm happy to clarify. Sorry, can I can I jump in and ask the question about the multi stability? Can you give some intuition about uh, where that's going? Yeah, so so you see, so here, so so you have this positive feedback here, right? So this positive feedback so that's basically is given by the overlap between just vectors n and m. So I told you that n determines which direction of the activity is integrated into kappa. And so if n overlaps with m, then there's a positive feedback. And if this positive feedback is large enough, so it's basically larger than one, uh, well, a linear system would explode, but the nonlinear system will just give you a, a, a two phase points. So this is a bifurcation. Uh, what, this is a bifurcation basically when the overlap between n and m uh, crosses one. I see. Okay. All right. So now from here, I'm going to shift gears and go to 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 to, to, to the general case. 
Um, now, this is a general case, meaning arbit arbitrary rank. Uh, and so, yeah, so if you have, if you increase the rank, so now we have one latent variable kappa for each rank term. And then, yeah, we, we also have one variable for, for, every, for every in input. And that the key intuition that, that, that I would like you to take from the previous slides is that what determines the dynamics is the statistics of this pattern. So basically the overlaps between this, the, the, these patterns. And now there's a, there's a useful way to think about the statistics of, of the patterns. So basically every neuron uh, has one input weight and then has n, 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 n uh, weights. So in this case, every neuron will have five weights. So we can represent every neuron as a point in five dimensional space. I'm going to call this connect the connectivity space. And here I'm, I'm showing uh, a bunch of projections of this connectivity space. So, uh, so the I, N, I, N, and, uh, and so on. So, so one neuron is one point in this connectivity space. Uh, and then we can do this for, for each neuron in the network so that the whole network will be represented by a cloud of points in, in this space. Now, basically if we extend the, the, our, our calculation to this general case, what we see is that the, the, the distribution in this space, so in this case, so this is a five dimensional space, so this distribution determines the, the dynamics. And the natural starting point is to look at the Gaussian distribution in this five dimensional space. And for, simpl for simplicity, so here it's a, it's, it's a zero mean Gaussian. So this Gaussian is fully characterized by a covariance matrix. And, uh, uh, and so this covariance matrix, so what is it? What is this? Well, so it's just, it's, it's just overlaps between these different vectors. And this covariance matrix so di directly determines the dynamics. So we can show that the dynamics of the kappas now obey, uh, well, uh, dynamics which are described by this, by this effective circuit where different kappas interact with each other through this effective weights. And so what are these weights? So, so these are basically the correlations between patterns multiplied by the, by, the, by the average gain. So this is just a generalization of the picture that I showed you for uh, in the case of, 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 of a rank one network. So, so, so here it's, it's rank two, but we can do this in, 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 in rank R and the dynamics look like this. So, it's, it's, so they look like, like linear dynamics except that they're not linear because, because of, this, of this gain term, which implicitly depends on the gain term. Um, okay, uh, so, so one way of think of this, so we can forget about the, the inputs. So remove the, um, remove the inputs. And so this is now, this is a dynamical system. And so in this case, it's a two dimensional dynamical system. So we can think of it as, as a flow in a, in a dynamical landscape. And, and as I told you, so this is a non-linear non system, so we can have non-trivial phenomena such as multiple fixed points. Uh, but so remember that we assume the Gaussian distribution here. So this is, so this is all for a single Gaussian distribution. And the key question is whether this is a, a limiting assumption or not. So can we get any dynamical system uh, from by, by using just a single Gaussian distribution and varying the and varying the covariance, and this is something we looked at, at and so we real, realized that actually no, so this having a single Gaussian distribution is actually a limiting factor, um, and, and in fact, it's, so, so it limits the range of dynamical landscapes that the system can can, can generate. So so we can show, for example, that it's not possible to have an arbitrary arrangement of fixed points. So in general, such a system will have at most the two fixed points. Uh, so, so basically, if we want to have a more general uh, dynamical system, so a broader range of dynamics, well, we need to, to look at more general distributions. So, so, so I'm back to this description in terms of this connectivity space. So in the previous Sorry. slides, yeah. Can I ask a quick question? So if you had yes. more like N1 and N2 and N3, would then a Gaussian distribution give you more fixed points? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. So um, uh, yeah, the answer is no. 
And it's, oh. it's, it's, it's quite interesting. So, um, so increasing the rank, so it's going to increase the dimensionality of the dynamical system. So, so we'll have more kappas, so higher dimensional dynamical system. However, if you, if you analyze, if you look at how many fixed points you can get, uh, well, in fact, everything is, some, yeah, every, th th this kind of a symmetry, which prevents for, from having more than, than, than two fixed points. And this is basically due to the fact that here, so this effective couplings, they're all scaled by the same gain term. So this, this is a key point. So this, this gain term, so this is a scalar that multiplies all, all, all the couplings. And, the, and that's, that's a limiting factor. Could I follow up on that, if I, if I may? Sure. Um, so, so in one extreme, when n is equal to m for all of the n's and m's, I think you can get many fixed points, right? So actually, because, um, or is that not is that not the case? No. So, so okay. So, I guess your intuition is that if n is equal, equal to m. Uh, well, that's actually the Hopfield model. It's just, it yeah, looks exactly. like a Hopfield model, so it's a symmetric matrix. However, in the Hopf in the Hopfield model, the weights are binary; they're not Gaussian. Mm. So, and, and, and that's actually a key difference. Mm. Uh, it's, 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 so, so, in fact, in, in the Hopfield model, if you take Gaussian weights, then you, you, yeah, you, you're also limited by the number of fixed points that you, that you can have. Another follow-up question. If phi's are different, heterogeneous across neurons, what happens? If phi's are different, so, so the f transfer functions are different. Hmm. Yeah, so I think that's then the same as, 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 take, as taking a more complicated distribution, so a more heterogeneous distribution uh, in, in the connectivity space. I think it's, it, maybe it's not exactly equivalent, but it's something along those lines. And, and so, so, yeah, so maybe the, well, maybe in the next slides we'll we'll, we'll address more that, that that question. Any 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 more questions before I I continue? No. Okay. So, all right. So we need to go beyond a single Gaussian, and uh, yeah. So there are many ways to go beyond the Gaussian, but one way that we found particularly useful is to look at mixture of Gaussian distribution. So what, what is a mixture of Gaussians? Uh, well, that's actually equivalent to splitting neurons into populations. And so, so here, for example, two populations, the bluish and the greenish population. Uh, and then, so we assume that neurons in the bluish population uh, will have connectivity generated from one Gaussian and neurons from the greenish population have, have connectivity generated by from another Gaussian. And so that's the same as having two different clusters. So remember, these are two dimensional projections of, of, a, of a five dimensional distribution. And so, so these two dimensional projections show that there are two different clusters. And every cluster corresponds to a, to a Gaussian distribution with a different covariance matrix. Um, okay, so why, why is this the right way to go? Uh, well, for us, well, th th there are a couple of arguments. So one is that, so if you increase the number of Gaussians, you can actually approximate any, any probability distribution. So, uh, so, so that's one way of approximating an arbitrary for, for the distribution. The other ar argument is that this type of, of distributions, well, turns out to be uh, analytically tractable within our, our framework. So it's very easy to extend our framework to, to, to those kind of, of, of distributions. And I think that there are more arguments for using mix, mixture of Gaussians, but uh, yeah, we're still working on, on, working on those. Okay, so I told you that, that our framework extends nicely. So, so, so what, do, what do I mean? So, well, we can again compute the effective dynamics now, now assuming this broader class of distributions. And, and in fact, the, the effective dynamics look exactly the same. So we still have this effective circuit where different latent variables interact through effective couplings. So what changes is the form of these effective couplings. So previously, so for a single, for a single uh, Gaussian distribution, the effective coupling was again multiplied by the covariance matrix. Now, if we have several populations, so several Gaussian populations, the effective coupling is, 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 is just a sum of those terms. 
So it's basically a sum of covariance matrices multiplied by the gain for each population. And now, so, so, so again, this is, this is for this mixture of Gaussians, this is an exact nonlinear de description because so these guys, so these gains, they depend on the activity and, 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 on, and on the inputs. And so I think this answers the previous question. So what if you give different, uh, different uh, nonlinearities to different neurons? Well, that, that's going to, to lead to different gains for, for, for different populations. So it, it directly fits within, within this framework here. And also, why is this richer than the single Gaussian? Well, it's richer because now you can modulate these gains of different populations independently in principle. And so you, you can uh, span a much larger range of effective connectivities uh, than, than before for, for single Gaussian. And in fact, so what we can show, so, so what, what we show in this paper here is that if you allow the network to have an arbitrary number of populations, well, then in principle, you can approximate any nonlinear dynamical system in, with, uh, uh, in, in, the, in this framework. Okay, so this, oh, this takes me to, to the end of this first part about the theoretical framework. So I, I'm, I'm just going to summarize this and then, then take questions again. Um, so the key point is that, so, so in our, so our, our framework is based on the simplified class of connectivity matrices. And so this connectivity matrices have two types of structure. So the first type of structure is this rank. And so the rank of the connectivity matrix, it, well, it sets the dimensionality, it determines the number of latent variable that are generated by the, by the dynamics. Okay, so that's one type of structure. The second type of structure is this distribution of these elements of, uh, uh, of the patterns and so in general, so, so we find it useful to think of those as in terms of subpopulations. And then the subpopulations, what they do is that they shape the dynamics by shaping the effective, the effective interactions between the different latent variables. And so in general, this is in fact a very, very rich framework because we can, so we can increase rank to have an arbitrary number of latent variables and we can change populations to have arbitrary dynamics uh, in, in a given dimensionality. All right, so that's that's the framework. So I'm, I'm so this yeah, this is a good time for, for questions. I, I have one question, if I may ask. So you assume that uh, entries of the n and m vectors are coming from some distributions, and at the same time you're assuming that n one and n two are orthogonal because they are coming from an SVD decomposition, right? Um, no, so they they don't necessarily need to be orthogonal. So so. Um, um, it's it's useful to make them orthogonal, but they, they don't they don't necessarily need to need to be orthogonal. So you can extend you can extend the framework to to, to non-orthogonal vectors. So the only assumption that you need you need you need to know that the connectivity matrix is decomposable to something low rank plus some noise uh, terms. Yeah, I mean that's always the case, but the question is how good is that approximation? You know, because we're throwing away some higher rank terms. No, this is, so that that's really the question. So, are we allowed to do this or not? And and uh, and in, yeah, the criteria there is how strong are the low rank terms. Thanks. Thanks. Is the number of the uh, Gaussians uh, correlated with the number of attractors that you have? With the number of attractors. Um, in, in principle, yes. So, so the more Gaussians that you have, the more the more fixed points you can have. Yeah. So, 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 so in a sense, in in the Hopfield network, for example. So, so, so that's the case where, um, okay, it's an extreme case where the where the Gaussians are the variance of the Gaussians is zero, and you get just uh, uh, okay non-zero mean Gaussians, and, and and then so for for every fixed point you 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 you, you add Gaussians in a sense. You, you add populations. Sorry, this this might be a slightly tangential and technical point, but uh, is the in the nonlinear case uh, is the saturation an important point, or it does not matter? 
Um, yeah, it definitely matters for the fixed points because you know the linear case is the case where you don't have a, sat a saturation. And then if you have strong positive feedback, uh, the activity starts blowing up. And now if you don't have some kind of saturations, saturation, the, the activity will just blow up. So you need, to, you need a saturation to, uh, to limit. Okay, so, so, so is your question uh, whether we could use a transfer function that doesn't saturate, but that it's sort of uh, the, the, where the gain kind of reduces? Yeah, essentially. <laughs> or can you absorb any of that in the mean of uh, distributions and still get things to work? Ah, no, so, so you can't absorb it in the distributions, but yeah, you need some kind of nonlinearity, but perhaps, I mean, there's something to determine, to be determined, but yeah, maybe you don't need a saturating nonlinearity, but something where the gain sort of progressively is, is progressively reduced. All right, so there are no more questions, so I'm, I, I'm going to carry on. So, uh, all right, so, so just as a summary, so I started with this big picture of connecting structure and function. So basically what I described so far is, is kind of a tool, a class of models in which we can, well, from the structure directly predict the latent dynamics that the, 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 the recurrent network generates. Uh, all right, but now there's a second question, which is, you know, if you give me a task, a behavioral task or a comp input output computation, what kind of latent dynamics do you need to, 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 to implement this? And, and so this is, yes, so uh, this, this is also a pretty open question. So I, I don't think there's a systematic way to answer this. And so, uh, so, so what we did is to, to turn to well-trained networks. So we, we, we start from a task, train networks, and then try to reverse engineer them to understand how 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 they, how they work, so so let me try to um, explain you how we do this. Okay, so first, we, so we look at at neuroscience tasks. So we, we look at we looked at the range of classical neuroscience tasks, starting from simple uh, random dot perceptual decision making, um, going to context, context dependent decision making, daily match to sample, and and so we train RNNs to do those tasks, and then we develop the pipeline to reduce those, those trained RNNs to effective circuits, which effective, uh, well, dynamical, low dimensional dynamical systems. Okay, so this, this, this is this pipeline. So it relies on this framework of low rank networks that, that, that I just uh, um, introduced. Uh, so, okay, so we start by training an RNN, but we do this in a special way. So we, we, we look for, an RNN of a minimal rank that implements a task. So basically we do, we fix the rank of an RNN and then we do a, well, basically gradient descent on this N and M parameters. And then we progressively decrease the rank until we don't find a solution anymore. Okay, so in that way, so, so we find, well, a minimal rank RNN that performs a task. And so this minimal rank RNN is going to be described in terms of a set of patterns, so input patterns and, and connectivity patterns as, uh, as previously. Okay, so then the next step is to look at the statistics of these obtained patterns. And so the way we do this is that, uh, so I told you that a nice way to represent this connectivity is for every neuron to take the parameters here of, um, of, of uh, in the different vectors. And so plot, oops, sorry, and, and basically plot every neuron as a point in this connectivity space. And so the, then the whole network is a cloud. And so now again, so here it's five dimensional and these are two dimensional projections. And then the next step is that we're, we're going to try to approximate this cloud using a, a mixture of Gaussian uh, by minimizing the number of clusters, the number of populations that we need to, to, to approximate this cloud. This. And uh, so while the standard algorithms for fitting a you know, mixture of Gaussian clusters, uh, which will always give you some clusters, but then the quick question is, is this a good description? So what we do is, so we determine the clusters and then to check that this is the right description, we, we generate randomly sampled networks from this obtained um, mixture of Gaussian distribution. And we check whether those networks still perform the task. And I will, I will show you examples of that. 
uh, but basically, so at the end, what this gives us is, is, is a description in terms of a mixture of Gaussian, where every Gaussian is, the term, is, is, is characterized by, by a covariance matrix. And once we have that, well, then we can basically derive an effective circuit uh, for this low rank mixture of Gaussian model, just well, simply in the way that I, uh, that I showed you before. So we describe the dynamics in terms of interacting with latent variables where the interactions are basically effective interactions set by, by these covariance matrices. And, and so what, what basically this pipeline, what it does is it, it, it drastically reduces the number of parameters uh, in the RNN. So general RNN would have like n square parameters. Uh, constraining it to be a low rank, we get the number of parameters that is linear RNN. Uh, but then we go further and, and describe those parameters as, as Gaussian distribution. So we, we just end up uh, well here, uh, well, with, with a small number of parameters. And then we can further determine which parameters really matter by, by looking at, at, the, at, the, at the support. Okay, so, so we can run this pipeline on, on different tasks. And so, so the first thing that this gives us is the minimal rank and a minimal number of population for, for each of the tasks. And eventually, so it gives us an effective circuit for the latent variables uh, that, that implement the, the, uh, these tasks. Okay, so with this, we did this for a range of tasks and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you, well, I was planning to show you two examples, so we'll see how, how, how I'm doing with time, uh, but maybe I'll, I'll take questions at, at this point about the pipeline and about the approach. So is there an effective regularization that could give you uh, minimal rank? Um, yeah, so there is a way, so, so if you look at this literature, I, I mean, so, this rank reduced problem. So this is something that's very standard. I mean, very uh, uh, very widely used in the, in the st statistics literature. Uh, so an effective regularization is what is called the nuclear norm, which is the, um, the sum of singular values. So you, so you can add this as a regularization in, in principle, uh, uh, that's going to give you a minimal rank. Now in practice, so if you look at how people do this, it turns out, it's out that it's more efficient just to, to fix the rank by hand uh, fit the model and then reduce the rank until uh, uh, until we find the, the minimal one. So in practice, this is how people do it for um, for, for, for all problem for all problems of rank reduced uh, regressions and, and things like this in, in the statistics literature. Does this affect in a way the activity on X? I mean, having a minimal rank does that affect like a sort of a sparsity? <laughs> Yeah, so it doesn't, it doesn't affect the sparsity, but it does uh, it does force the dynamics to, to lie in a minimal dimension. Um, so, 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 so in, in a sense, it, it does push it for some minimal. So, so what, well, what we know is that we could find other solutions that also, for example, also rely on a single latent variable but this latent variable could live in a slightly higher space. And this is related, so you can think of this latent variables as describing a, a manifold. And a manifold so, so has an intrinsic dimension, which is the number of coordinates to describe the ma manifold. But then there's also an embedding dimension, which is uh, how many, what, what's the dimensionality of the space that the manifold is, lives in. Um, so in general, we could find solutions that are quite similar so in the sense that they rely on one latent variable, but that they're embedded in, in, in a higher, higher rank. Uh, so, so yeah, this procedure is pushing, the, uh, pushing us to, to find the sort of flattened, uh, flattened solutions. Okay, so um, yeah, so, so, so I'm going to start with, with the simplest uh, example. Uh, uh, which is uh, the random dot motion task, so, so perceptual decision making. So this is the, the task that I mentioned at the beginning. So, 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 so the stimulus in the experiments, the stimulus is a cloud of, of dots that move randomly. And then the animal needs to determine whether the, the dots are, are moving mainly to one side or, or to the other side. 
in practice, so how do we model this task? Well, um, we assume that we have one dimensional input. So, so we have a scalar value, which is the coherence of, of, the, of, of this dot of the, of the cloud. And so the scalar variable is, is fed into the network through, through a random set of, of, of weights. And so the scalar variable uh, well, fluctuates in time or around the mean. And then the goal of the network is to, uh, well, basically determine whether the mean was positive or negative. So it needs to average out the, 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 the fluctuations. Okay. Uh, and yes, and so in practice, so we take the input weights to be random, the output weights to be random, and then we, we, we ran uh, back propagation on, uh, on the recurrent connectivity. And so, so, so what our, our pi pipeline gives us, so well, the result that it gives us is that the minimal network is, is just rank one. So it looks very much like the network that I showed you um, the, at the beginning. So there's one input vector, one pair of connectivity vectors. And then, and then there's, a, there's a readout vector, which basically projects the activity on, on a single dimension. And now if you look at, um, okay, sorry, so this is, we call this now the connectivity space which is this space where we plot the parameters of, uh, of every neuron. So what we see is that basically, essentially just one, one single cluster. So, so a single Gaussian is enough to do this task. And so fitting a single Gaussian to the distribution of weights, so we get a correlation matrix. So this correlation matrix, so what, so what does it give us? Well, it basically says, what are the overlaps between those patterns? And at, at the beginning, so in this linear example, I showed you that well, the overlaps are, are what determines the, 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 the latent dynamics. Uh, okay, so, so how do we make sure that this is the right description? So, so, so we basically determine this, this co covariance matrix. And so once we have the co covariance matrix, we can generate new networks by sampling from, from a Gaussian distribution with this covariance matrix. And so if you generate resampled networks, uh, and well, we can then run them on the task and quantify how well they're doing. And, and you see they're doing, they're doing perfectly. So they're doing just as well as the train method. Although, uh, we, we, although we only control a couple of, of parameters here. And yeah, and so then the reduced model is the model that I showed you at the beginning. Um, you can actually think of the network in this case pretty much as, as a linear network because the nonlinearity does not play a big role. Uh, what happens is that, so we have one latent variable that corresponds to this rank one structure. And this latent variable integrates this fluctuating input through this effective connectivity, which is set by this covariance between N and I, so the overlap between N, N and I. And then there's some positive feedback which comes from the overlap between N and M. And this positive feedback, what it does is that, well, it increases the time scale of, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the latent variable. So it ensures that the latent variable integrates evidence. So this latent variable, in this case, it has a very simple interpretation. So it's, it's just the integrated evidence. So it's the averaged out uh, input. And now if you plot the effective dynamics, the low dimensional dynamics of this model, so, so, so we're in this, um, 2D projection where one, di one direction is the stimulus, the other direction is, is this latent variable, which is integrated evidence or choice. And what we get is something that looks very much like this projection from the, uh, from of Valerio Mantis data that I showed you at the very beginning, where the dynamics transform stimulus into, into, in, into, into one choice or, 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 or the other. Okay, so this was, this was the simplest case. Uh, any questions about this? I have a question. Um, the, so just about like interpretation of this result, is it, is it saying that I really don't need a high dimensional network to solve this task? I just need one variable basically? Like one neuron could solve this task because it, it ends up being one dimensional. Yeah, exactly. And, and in a sense, we knew this. I mean, so, you know, the classical models of decision making, this is just integration to bound. And this is, this is, this is pretty much integration to bound. 
So, mm -hmm. so, so this says that all, you know, this complex procedure of training networks, it sort of just recovers um, uh, integration to the bound. Do you see, is there anything gained by employing like distributed representation to achieve the low rank or low dimensional dynamics or? Uh, so in fact, I mean, if you want, if you want to implement only one task, then, yeah. then no, I mean, you, you can as well use one neuron. But if you want to implement multiple tasks, then you can use it, you can exploit this, this, this distributed representations and, and start, uh, you know, having different tasks in different subspaces. And uh, yes, yeah, so this is not something I was planning to talk about, but that's that's one of the advantages. And the other advantage is just re robustness, because here every each neuron contributes very little. So every every neuron contributes just a one over n factor. So if you, you you know you can kill many of the neurons and nothing will change. So it's it's extremely robust. Thank you. Sorry, I have another related question. So uh, as far as I understand, there is a huge degeneracy, right? Because this solution is just given by the covariance matrix of the NNM. Yes. But are these solutions attractive in the dynamics of gradient descent? So say you, you reach one solution while minimizing the nuclear norm, then you perturb it, and then you run gradient descent without the rank minimization. Will it find a completely high, different solution? Like, will it flow onto a high rank solution, which performs mm -hmm. the task better or is more robust? Or? Yeah. Okay. So, so this is this is part of the, um, yeah. The, the, uh, so this collaboration that we have with uh, Friedrich Schussler and um, um, Omri at Technion. So, so with them, we, we looked at uh, full rank networks and trained full rank networks. And so what we found is that, so if you don't constrain the rank, um, well, stochastic gradient descent is actually going to, to, to lead to very low rank uh, changes in the connectivity. And maybe they're not gonna be one. So there's a little bit of randomness there. So, so if you run the network many times, you know, maybe it's gonna be two, three, but, but it's a very low rank change. And where does this come from? Well, it basically comes from the fact that the task itself is, is very low dimensional because you just have one input and one output. And so that, that in a sense, the, the connectivity changes that the stochastic gradient descent uh, implements are basically combinations of this, uh, of this, of these two vectors. Um, so, yeah, so, 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 so yeah, so what we found is that this, this low rank solutions are, are actually quite, quite general for, for low dimensional tasks. Thank you. Sorry, can I go back to this question about perturbations? So what, um, what kind of perturbations will really ruin function in your case? So, so the question was about perturbations during learning, but you mean perturbations after learning? Uh, yeah, perhaps uh, during learning and also after. Yeah, I mean, during learning, I. Uh, Let's let's first start after learning. <laughs> it's much easier. So, so, so okay. So suppose you do optogenetics on this on on, uh, on this network. So so you optogenetically inactivate neurons. Uh, well, in general, so if you just if your pattern of inactivations is random, well, in general, it's going to be orthogonal to all these vectors. So it's not going to change the the, the dynamics and the computations at all. So so this kind of perturbations. The network is very uh, robust too. So if you want to do something significant to the network, you really need to perturb it in the direction of one of these vectors. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, it's very unlikely that you will find those by chance. Uh, okay, so that's that's perturbations after learning. So perturbations during learning. Um, yeah, so there. Um, Okay, so we, we have an on, ongoing project where we look at what happens when you learn more, more than one task. And there, yeah, so you can have like um, non-trivial interferences between tasks depending on how you learn the tasks. Uh, and this is related to, um, to the phenomenon, the well-known phenomena of uh, catastrophic forgetting. Uh, so, so um, yeah, but I think that's, that's, that, that's, a different, uh, this, uh, that's a different topic. So, so basically, if you want to prevent catastrophic forgetting, you, well, you need to, to organize your learning in, 
in, in, in a nice way. So we make sure it's a target. All right, yeah, good. Thanks, yeah. So a quick question here about um, this uh, idea of uh, uh, basically what, what you pointed out about um, training using stochastic gradient descent without um, trying to uh, constrain the rank. Does that affect um, does that affect any uh, like the time of training? How fast these networks learn? Mm -hmm. In the sense that, I mean, I, I could see it going either way. If you constrain it, it might actually help the network find a solution more quickly, particularly if the problem is uh, low dimensional. But it could also, you know, reduce the degrees of freedom. So, any any ideas about those? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's that's a great question. So. Um, yeah, I mean, if you constrain it, um, then, I mean, for the learning, the initial conditions matter. So, so, you know, if you start from initial condition, when initial condition with everything is orthogonal, uh, you're going to get very little act relevant activity in the network. And then it's, uh, then there's nothing that the, the gradient can pick up. So that's, yeah, that, so. that's the key point. So, 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 so then, so you basically need to start from some initial condition where the overlaps are non, are non zero. So that's, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's true that this full rank connectivity can kind of alleviate this problem. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's, uh, so that's part of this NeurIPS paper that I flashed at the beginning. So where we, where we do full rank. So, so what, what we find is that just adding random connectivity in the initial condition is going to accelerate learning because it gives you um, yeah non-zero non -zero activity for, for, for the gradient. And okay. you, you will still find a low rank structure, but you will find it faster if you have a random uh, component to the connectivity. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, so then so I'm going to, to carry on. So this, okay, so this was the simplest task, so the, the random dot motion task. Um, yeah, and then the question, so, so for us originally, the question was what happens if you go to more complicated tasks? And originally we thought that maybe, you know, just increasing rank, we would be able to implement any, any task. And it's true that increasing rank, so we can implement more complex tasks, for, for example, uh, uh, working memory tasks, where we need another rank term just to store the uh, variables in, in, in working memory. But then we realized that there are tasks that we, we didn't manage to, 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 to implement, um, well, if we increased the rank and kept only one population. So that task for which it looks like we need more than one population. And uh, so the simplest example of this task is this context dependent decision-making or so, so, the, the, so the task of Valeria Monte and, 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 and David Cicero. And so I'm, go I'm going to move to, to this now. Okay, so, so just what is the task? So it's, it's an extension of this random dot motion task where the stimulus now has two features. So one feature is the same as before, so it's motion. And the other feature is color, which is the fraction of, of dots that are of, 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 of a given, given color. So we basically have a 2D stimulus. And so I'm gonna call those features A and B. And then there are two different contexts. The context is indicated by an external cue. And so in one, one context, uh, the animal needs to take the decision with respect to motion. So there's a, there's a decision boundary, which is basically vertical. So that's context A. While in the other, the other, in the other context, the animal needs to take the decision the opposite um, uh, with respect to the opposite feature. And so the decision boundary is then, is then horizontal. And the key point is that, so if you look, so, so this is a representation of the stimulus space. So, so, so you have sets of stimuli in which the two features are um, point in opposite direction, so they're incongruent. And for these stimuli, well, basically switching context means that the, the relevant response switches. And so this is, this is a well-known uh, difficulty. So, so these are called flexible input-output task because for the same input, you need two different responses depending on the context. And, and this is also an example of, of, of a simple X or uh, so this is classically known as, 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 a, as a difficult thing to do. Okay, so, so we train networks uh, basically following what uh, Valerio Montes and David Susilo did, which is that, so the stimulus is now two dimensional. So it has two features along 
two random uh, vectors of weights. And we also have contextual cues, which are also just inputs. So they're also just additive inputs. It's, it's important to realize that the complex are additive inputs for, for each complex. Uh, uh, and then, yeah, and then there's a readout, and the readout basically uh, has to implement the, the correct response depending on the context. Uh, okay, so this is the basic setup, and then as before, we're going to train the recurrent connectivity using our pipeline, so looking for, 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 for the minimal, minimal rank and minimal number of populations. And so our first surprise was that in this task, we found that the minimal rank was also one which we didn't like, necessarily expect. Um, so that's the first surprise. The second surprise was that in this case, a single population was not enough. Okay, so this is what the network, network looks like. So now we have these two different features. So uh, motion and, uh, and color. So the network is rank one. So there's only one pair of connectivity vectors and then there's a readout. Now, if we, if we fit the, this connectivity statistics, just with a single Gaussian, and if we resample from it, uh, well, the accuracy drops significantly. And now, if you look at the details of what is going on, so you can think of this as uh, as psychometric uh, curves. So this is the stimulus motion color, and this is the target output. So this is in the two contexts. Well, in the single in networks with a single population, what happens is that. Uh, well, basically, the network does not perform a context-dependent computation. It does the same thing in, in the two contexts. And in particular, it completely messes up this incongruent stimuli, which pointed opposite direction. So the stimuli, which were in these two boxes, for which, in principle, the responses need to be reversed. Well, this network does not reverse at all the, the responses. So it, it has a problem with its flexibility. All right. So then what we did is, so we went one step further and, and we fit now a two population distribution to, 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 to these vectors. And now resampling from two populations, well, wh wh what we see is that, well, it basically rescues this, this context dependent computation. So, so, so two, a two population network does uh, the task just, just fine. Okay, so, so how does it work? What, what, what is going on? Um, okay, so I'm trying to, uh, I will try to, to, to summarize, uh, well, the mechanism. So basically, no, the neurons are split in two populations. So, so the blue and, and the green population. And so what are the differences between the populations? So there, there, there are two differences. Um, <clears throat> so one is that the two, so, so one, one difference between the population is the strength of the contextual inputs. So, one population gets strong, so each population gets strong inputs, strong contextual inputs in a different context. So one population is strongly modulated by context B, the other population is strongly modulated by, by, by context A. And what that means is that basically these contextual inputs, they change the gains in the two populations in a differential manner. So in, so in one context, so, so this, purple population has strong gain in the other context. So this gain is become, becomes on the average much lower. So, so while, while for the green population, the gain, the gain goes, goes up. Okay, so there's basically a gain modulation between the two populations. Now, the other feature of the two populations is that so the blue population, so this end vector is aligned with, with, with feature A, while for the Green population, the, the, the end vector is aligned with, with a feature B. And so that means that this blue population basically integrates motion, and the green population basically integrates motion uh, color. But, but they're, they're basically switched on and off by the context which modulates their gain. So this is, this is what the effective circuit looks like. So we still have just one latent variable which just which is just an integrated evidence for left, left, or right. And, and this one latent variable, so it integrates both features, so through effective weights, but the two contexts modulate this effective integration weights by modulating the, the, the gains of the two of the two. 
And yeah, so in a sense, this so, so, so here we have two sets of inputs. So we have the stimulus inputs and the context inputs, and they, they play different roles. So the, the, the stimulus inputs, they directly drive the latent dynamics. So, 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 so they're directly integrated by the, by the, uh, the latent dynamics. Why this contextual inputs, they don't directly excite the, 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 the contextual, the, the, the latent variable, they just modulate the gain. So to modulate the effective uh, strength with which the, the, the inputs are, 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 are integrated. Okay, so this is, yeah, this is definitely the, the most complex part of the talk and the, the densest one. So maybe I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop and take, take questions here again. Uh, hello, I had a question. Um, this is this is a more general question. I, I, I um, it's not deep into the theory. Uh, it, it's for these models. Uh, the context is uh, is it mostly kind of pre-processed? That is, if if you uh, uh, for in the Valerio Monte paper, I'm taking a look at it right now. Um, so they have this recurrent neural network, and then the two contexts they inputted are um, some abstraction of motion and color of the task. So if if you wanted to build like a, a whole, it's like a simple brain, you have to have like a pre-processing stage of spiking uh, neurons that take in the what the monkey sees, pre-process it such that uh, the decision-making model can um, take that input and uh, do the learning. Uh, oh. Yeah, so um, so maybe so. I, I guess the question is how how constraints are the, how constrained are these inputs for, for, for the metric to to work correctly, right? Yeah, sure. So, so um, yeah, and the result is that so, so, so in, in in fact. Uh, yeah, the constraints are pretty weak, so it, it doesn't. You don't need much pre-processing. You do need to, in a sense, decorrelate the, uh, the the inputs, uh, and th that would be the that would be the main pre-processing. So you want your the two the two cues to to have different effects. But uh, apart from that, um, you know, just taking them random independent, uh, it's 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 enough. So there's not a huge amount of uh, pre-processing that's required here. Thanks. All right. Um, yeah, so I described this context-dependent decision-making task. And so what I tried to explain is that, so two populations are needed here because of this flexible input-output uh, nature of the task. So, so basically because of the fact that the same stimulus requires different responses in different contexts. And so, well, we, we found the same phenomenon in, in another task, which is the delay match to sample task. So this is a task where um, an animal is shown one picture, so then there's a delay, and then there's a second picture, and then the animal has to say whether the two, two pictures were the same or different. And you can also think of, of this task as a context-dependent task. So if you focus only on the second stimulus, then the response to the second stimulus is going to de depend on what the first stimulus was. So you can think of the first stimulus as a kind of contextual cue and the second one as, as the stimulus for, for which the context-dependent response is required. And so we found that for this task also, uh, well, we needed more than, more than one population. And so, um, okay, so we, we, don't, we don't have a general theory of, so if you give me a task, you know, how many populations do you need? So, 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 so this, this is something that would be, well, at this stage we find quite challenging. So, so, so this is, so, well, this is kind of just sampling different tasks, but what this suggests and what this defective circuit suggests is that, so if you need this to change the responses so if you have an XOR basically hidden in the task, then the, then you need to, you need more than one population. And so yeah, and, and so so I wanted to just to end by sort of giving you some intuition of what is going on. So so when do we need more 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 than one uh, uh, population? 
Um, so, okay, so this is again the low rank framework. So, 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 so the network is represented as a set of, of patterns. Um, and what I've shown you is that, um, so, so we, we can reduce this network to two equivalent descriptions. So one is a dynamical system in this latent space. So where every axis is one latent variable and then you can think of the dynamics as, as a flow in a, in a dynamical uh, landscape. And there's, th then there's another uh, equivalent description in terms of an effective circuit where these latent variables interact with each other uh, through effective couplings. And so, and, and these two descriptions are in fact, so mathematically equivalent. And so the rank sets the dimensionality and the populations then modulate this, this, uh, this, uh, this direction. So, so why do we need uh, more than one, one population? So if you have single populations, what I've told you is that while well, we get a limited range of dynamics and equivalently, so, so the range of effective couplings is also constrained because all the couplings are basically multiplied by the same uh, gain time. Um, however, if you have multiple populations, then we can we can show that the autonomous we can get arbitrary autonomous dynamics. So, so for a rank two network, we can we can implement any rank two uh, dynamical system, uh, and 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 equivalently in this effective circuit picture, this corresponds to being able to to modulate the, uh, the effective couplings in a much more flexible way, and basically to change the different couplings in the independent. And, and so in particular, so it's, it seems that this is important to implement uh, context-dependent computations uh, because so in this, in this context-dependent computation, you can think of the contextual input as shifting uh, this latent space um, to, to, to a different part of, uh, of phase space. Uh, and by shifting it, well, this changes the, the, the dynamical landscape. Another question is how much can a contextual input change the dynamical landscape? Well, if there's only a single population, uh, there's a limit in how much you can change it. But if you have multiple populations, uh, well, the contextual input can, can lead to arbitrary auto aut autonomous dynamics. And this is, this is very similar to, to basically modulating the effective interaction so that for every context, the effective circuit is actually different. Uh, and so, 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 so basically this multiple population structure, it allows this non-linear control of the of dynamical landscape and of, 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 of effective interactions. Okay, and so I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to, uh, to, 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 to summarize and conclude. Uh, all right, so today, well, I, I, well, I'll try to introduce a theoretical framework which allows us to relate structure and dynamics in recurrent neural networks. And I hope I convince you that this is, a, okay, it's a simplified framework, but it's, it's, it's very rich in terms of the dynamics that you can get and the computations you can, uh, um, uh, computations that we can, we can implement. Uh, and so in particular, we applied this, this framework to, to, to interpret RNN and strained on neuroscience tests, but uh, well, I think this framework can be, can be applied for, for many different uh, uh, situations where the, uh, well, basically where the dynamics are, are, are given by a dynamical system. And so what we did is, so we used this framework to classify tasks according to the minimum required dimension and number of cell classes. So we have these two different hyperparameters in a sense, which are the rank and the number of cell classes. And we find that this having cell classes, uh, well, plays an important role uh, because it facilitates implemented, uh, implementing flexible XO-based tasks. And, and the underlying mechanism is this nonlinear control of the current dynamics through a modulation of effective computation. So I just wanted to, to uh, thank my collaborators again. So they're really a, a great team. It's been a great pleasure working with them. And so, um, yeah, at this stage, I'll, uh, I'll thank everybody who's, uh, who's here, who's been listening. And I don't know if there's time for more questions. Or... Yeah, so let's all, um, first of all, thank the speaker for a really wonderful talk. That was super engaging. And, uh, um, if there are a few straggling questions, we can bring them up right now and uh...